If you will, take your Bibles this morning and turn to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6 today, we're going to begin in verse number 6 in just a moment. If I forget at the end, I'll do my best not to, but we do have a small gift for our fathers today, and I'll make sure we do that right after the uh, study today. But uh, so glad you're here today, our men, and uh, grateful for you, your leadership, your sacrifices, just working hard and doing your best to model um, God's grace in your family and in your areas of influence. Micah chapter 6 today, and let's stand together if you're able to do so for a moment out of respect for God's word. If you're not, that's fine. Micah chapter 6, and let's look at beginning in verse number 6. Micah chapter 6, and let's begin in verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Notice verse 8, probably a verse familiar to most of us. He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? Notice now this triune, these three parts of what God requires, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. This morning for a few minutes we want to look at this subject, the ultimate man card. The ultimate man card. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege it is to be here today. Thank you for these lyrics, these truths, these melodies that have washed over us again today. Um, Lord, to know that we are complete in you, that this is your world, that you own it, and someday you will redeem and restore all things. Lord, the hope that that gives, the confidence that gives. I pray if there's one here who is yet to put faith in Christ, which is the only way, truth, and life to the Father, and Father, they would be open to that application today. Pray for believers who are beleaguered and downtrodden and maybe discouraged and disconnected in different ways in their life today, that you would renew their focus upon you, their Father, and that, Lord, ultimately you will redeem them, body, soul, and spirit, through your redemptive work. Pray, Father, as we study your word today, that you would help first our men, um, Lord, to shoulder their responsibilities before you and for others that follow them and that partner with them to do the same. We love you. Thank you for being so clear in your expectations of us and through the enabling of your spirit to help us meet what you require of us. Bless this study, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Now, if you ever heard the term before, man card or not, you know, turn over your man card give up your man card, something to that effect. But the term basically means it's a proverbial license to be a man that can be lost by saying, doing, or being something that is beneath manliness. Everybody with me? Whether you can grow a beard as is in the graphic today or not, I, Justin back here has got one going. Some of us are a bit more feeble in our attempts at facial hair, but things that are manly and things that are unmanly. And I just wanted to read a few from a list that I thought were interesting. You lose your man card if the following things are true of you. So you men, uh, if you duck your head or you, you drop your eyes from me, I'll know you're guilty as charged. You lose your man card if, number one, you eat fried chicken with a fork. That's just, you know, you're, you're a failure as a man. Number two, take selfies in the mirror. That's a huge one in my view. Uh, ask your spouse to drive on a date that you have with them. Uh, share an umbrella with another man. I thought that was hilarious. Back off, I'm going to get wet and be a man. That's how I would pro approach that. Uh, you lose your man card if you know who is the reigning gold medalist in men's figure skating, right? It's over. Uh, ask, uh, you lose your man card if you ask for assistance with installing your windshield wipers from anyone, all right? Uh, you should be able to do that on your own. Uh, you lose your man card uh, if you have a Pinterest account. Uh, if you cut your cheeseburger in half, that's a huge one. Uh, if you can't uh, st uh, drive a stick shift vehicle. Uh, if you've never shot a gun, and then I like these last two. If you choose salad over steak. Actually, if you choose anything over steak, you lose your man card. And then my favorite was this. You lose your man card if you have ever used a Snuggie. Any of you remember those? Those little blanket pill? Any of you men? Some of you are deeply offended now by that. You lose... Uh, your man card. Can I just say as we begin today, men are the only ones that God intended to be fathers. Is that not correct? I can't believe I have to say that in our day. God has intended for men to be fathers. 
So if that is true, then the best way for us to be fathers is to first be the men that God has called us to be. And I hope whether you're a man today or not, that whether you feel like you just lost your, your man card through that list I just shared, that we all will support men being men so that men can be the fathers that God intended them to be. And so let's look at today here in our text. You will notice, we'll come back to verses 6 and 7 in just a moment, but notice he begins verse 8 by saying, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. He has showed thee what, O man, is good. And so by directing this toward men, toward man, notice that Micah tells this nation, and he begins with the men, that it's there that the change will occur, that God will be pleased when the men are what they should be for the Lord. And obviously, these requirements would apply to all of us. But he begins with these men and says to them, this is what God expects of you. In a world filled with artificial standards and stigmas that are associated with masculinity, how do we allow God to be the giver and preserver of what we are referring to today as our ultimate man card? Let's look at today three directional traits that are found at the end of verse number 8, that if we will embody these directional traits, uh, we can be the man uh, that God uh, longs for us to be. Number one, first of all, let's spend a few minutes talking about number one, we need to manifest to others outward masculinity. Notice he uses this phrase, do justly. Now, for each of these main points, it's very easy to just read Micah 6 and verse 8, and I would guarantee if you know any verses from Micah, that you've memorized or committed to memory, this is probably the first one on your list. Maybe the end where he goes on to talk about forgiving our sins. We'll get to that in just a moment. But Micah 6 and verse 8, it did not happen in a vacuum. It didn't happen in a silo. There was a context that God was speaking into. And so for each of these main points today, uh, we need to understand what Micah was confronting. Go back to chapter 2. Many in Micah's day were not doing justly, and God confronted them. Go back to chapter 2 for just a moment and look at verse number 1. Micah chapter 2, and look at verse number 1. God says, Woe to them through Micah that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. He doesn't deal with that anymore specifically, but our minds in our culture, what we live in, we could surmise what's being alluded to there. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away so they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. And I said, here I pray you, Micah 3, verse 1, O heads of Jacob, now he's dealing with leaders, and you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. And so you see this manipulation of leadership, this abusing of people and using them allegorically. It's using this idea of, of using them to feed themselves instead of doing right. And then the last one, chapter 6 and verse 11, shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? And so over and over, God through the prophet Micah was dealing with injustice in the day and challenging the men that they were to be a model of justice, doing justice, outward masculinity. And may I just say as we begin today, one of the areas that is of greatest concern is that if I were to ask the average young person or lady, what does masculinity look like? Many times it's less than just. It's less than right. May God help us to renew or for the first time engage in being outwardly what we should be as the man God intended for us. All right, let's talk about a few things under this, not on the slide, but there in your notes today in the bulletin that we can learn from in this area of outward masculinity. Number one, jot this down, visible extravagance does not impress God. And if you will, go back to verse number 7. So what does outward masculinity, what should it not be? What well, should not be extravagance, visible extravagance on the part of a man does not impress God. Go back to verse 7, the beginning of the verse. Uh, the prophet asks these rhetorical questions. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Visible extravagance. 
Uh, there was a story in the news a few weeks ago of a man. Uh, do you know what the little tight car looks like? You know, the little red car with the yellow roof and the little doors that, that prop out that a grown man should never try to get into because if he does, he's not going to get out of. But when we were younger as boys, we probably rode it, cruised around in one of those maybe, or our kids have, grandkids. A man, uh, I believe this was in Europe, I can't remember the country, built an adult-sized version of that car. It's even street legal, and they talked about different things he built. Uh, it's, uh, it has, uh, it's red and yellow, just like the little Tykes Cozy Coupe. Uh, it runs on gas, has lights, airbag, mirrors, and now and then the news store was saying you would see him cruising around town in it. The project took 1,000 hours and cost him $6,500 to complete. And he's cruising around in his little Tykes Cozy Coupe. Um, can I just say a lot of things that we do as men to try to compensate or to communicate end up making us look very childish where we should be manly. Uh, and so I'd like you to think about today maybe areas where you're doing extravagant things, but they're not substantive things. They're not things that please and honor the Lord and ultimately impact and bless your family. Micah here deals with this hyperbole. He's exaggerating that does the Lord want of his people where they are wrong and these men that are wrong, thousands of rams, all these wrong things they're doing, will they be made right by sacrificing thousands of rams or 10,000 flowing rivers of oil? And of course, these rhetorical uh, suggestions are not actually to be moved upon, but to emphasize that God wanted a change in their attitude and actions. He didn't just want to sacrifice, he wanted a change. He wanted them to grow up. He wanted them to be all that God had called them to be as a man of God. Um, and I think we've noticed this of us men. And I talked this morning with in our men's prayer meeting. You're welcome to join us for that at 845 if you want over in the classroom wing. But I was mentioning the men. Isn't it interesting? We as men, when we're wrong, the first thing we do is we try to compensate instead of repent. We do something big. Well, the wife, I just failed in this area, but maybe if I buy her this or I do this extravagant thing, she'll forget about where I failed her because she's focused on this. And we treat God the same way. Instead of repenting, we're compensating. We've got the, the fatted calf we're slaying. We've got the extravagant things that are illustrated here in Micah. Instead of getting real with God, we're trying to compensate with extravagance. And I notice a lot of erratic tone in the masculinity of our day where men do wrong and then they do something crazy or amazing here without dealing with where they have failed the Lord, failed their family. And so we need to realize visible extravagance as men does not impress the Lord. Um, remember David? Um, he ha commits adultery with Bathsheba and then he kills her rightful husband, Uriah, his most, one of his most faithful men in his, his army. And Nathan the prophet comes to David and starts telling this story of a man. Remember, he has all of his sheep, he has flock after flock, and then his neighbor has this little lamb he loves and coddles and even eats dinner with it. His, his kids, it's their favorite pet. And the man, when he has a guest come in, instead of slaying one of his thousands and thousands of sheep, takes this lamb and sacrifices it for the, uh, the feeding of his guest. And David responds with all this sense of justice, doesn't he? And amazing how much justice we have toward the sin of others. Uh, Brother Chuck touched on that today with pride. Um, and, and he says, this is what should happen. He should restore fourfold, and he should give his own life. He should do something extravagant to make it right. And what does Nathan say to David? He says, thou art the what? The man. We men want to take credit when credit is being shared. But we're not quite as prone to take the blame when the blame needs to be owned by someone. And so a man realizes, a godly man realizes that visible extravagance does not impress God. Dear sir, this morning you cannot buy off God. You must deal with your wrong actions. The world may say it's just men being men, but God says it's sin. And your extravagant excuses and compensations will never restore you in your relationship with the Lord. God has told us He's not impressed by extravagance. All right, now, notice in verse 8, he says, the Lord required thee, notice, to do justly. Number two, jot this down. Visible extravagance does not impress God. Number two, visible justice does honor God. Visible justice does honor God. Um, the other day I was, talk, or was noticing a comment made by a pastor friend of mine 
and he had just walked out of a, a restroom of a large retail store, and he just kind of, it was kind of a hot take on the situation, but I thought it had some wisdom in it. And he said this, hey men, it's a shame if we walk out of a public restroom and it doesn't look better when we leave. Let's stop leaving the mess for the store clerk, the minimum, minimum wage employee. Not a good look for men. Being a man is about protecting your environment and creating a safe and healthy culture for others. That's a practical way we do this. And I'm just, this is just practically today. If you didn't figure out our lobby, thanks for following the new flow. If you need to use the restrooms, they're now through the, the auditorium, the two lobbies, north and south. But when you walk into the restrooms, the, men, the ladies who clean our restrooms on Mondays and Wednesdays or whenever they come in during the week, which room should be the cleanest? Which room should be the most just in how it's managed? Uh, and sadly, often in church buildings and retail shopping centers, it's the men's bathroom no one wants to go in, let alone be in charge of cleaning. Do justice. Do right in the areas that God has given you oversight in. This word of outwardly masculinity means to deal righteously and fairly with other people. Are you doing right by others, men? Or are you cutting corners at every uh, opportunity uh, that you can find? Unfortunately, men are too often using their male advantages to be purveyors of injustice. That's why people hate men. That's why manhood is on such a decline, because often it has been misused. It has been abused. Instead of using their strengths and their abilities to put forward justice. That is wrong no matter what other person gives you your man card for doing so. Some man cards are handed out for doing wrong. And that's what a man does right there. A man's always a part of that or advancing that cause. I May mean, we be very careful to realize visible justice alone honors God. Do you have a healthy sense of justice? And if you do, is it primarily man? Is it applied to you? I'm amazed at the men who right now could say what's going wrong at work right now. You know exactly what's wrong with the boss. You know what's wrong with the corporation. You know what's wrong in your neighborhood. You know what's wrong maybe even in this church. But do you apply that sense of justice to your own heart, to your own home, to your own life? May we do justice by first allowing God to put the spotlight where we live and where we lead. Um, the other day I heard a great statement by Richard Baxter. He said this, listen to this, Shall a wicked master of a family think to maintain his authority over others while he rebels against the authority of God? Shall a wicked master of a family think to maintain his authority over others while he rebels against the authority of God? You've you got to first deal with God yourself, sir, man, me. We need to, if we're ever to be a leader that ultimately serves and honors the Lord. You and I will never keep the man card God wants to give us with injustice. Choose instead to honor God with justice. All right, number two, go back to our text to verse number eight. So he has showed thee, O man, what is good, what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly. Notice secondly, and to love mercy. Number two, secondly, we need inward masculinity. So outward would be the doing of justice. This loving of mercy has to do with what does being a man in God's eyes look like on the inside, a God who sees inside of us and frames a view and opinion of us more based upon that. Um, the other day, Heidi was uh, telling me about the shop that she works at right now that she's winding down at in Seville. Um, they had a family come in. She's always telling me stories about some cute kid or something interesting that happened. Retail stores are interesting. Some of you work retail. Um, you know, go walk some of the stores during the day or in the evening. It's crazy what people do or think or say when they think no one's watching and there's all kinds of security cameras things. Anyway, the other day she was showing me or tell me about a dog that came in. This is not a picture of that actual dog, but she sent me one close to it. Um, and she was telling me, all, it's an English bulldog, right? Little pup. And it just, you know, the, it, basically it takes three steps before its wrinkles catch up kind of thing. You know, that's kind of the feel of this dog. It's cute. And she just was going on about this thing. Literally, you just hold it in your hand. It's so cute and whatever. And, and my boy, you know, us guys like, you know, give me a real dog, okay? That's, I think I've talked to you about, we have a teddy bear dog that literally is like eight pounds. It has no bear at all. It's all teddy. It's just this dinky little dog. It's a, it's a cute dog, but it, I don't know if it should be called a dog. You know, sometimes it looks more like a cat. But anyway, um, we men, we pride ourselves on being tough, don't we? I'm a man. But can I say that masculinity 
from God's perspective as a heavenly father, is most often and most fully orbed or developed when we are being tender. A man who restrains with the help of the Holy Spirit his powers and even his, his rough edges, when that is tempered by the Spirit, now a man's becoming what God has intended them to be, a picture of him, a God who is not just tough, but is also tender. And so this inward masculinity, this sense of mercy. Now go back to our text here, to chapter 2 of Micah. And as Micah called out these men and called out this nation to be more in this area, you see him confronting some areas where they had abandoned or never had assimilated, uh, internalized this love of mercy. Go back to chapter 2 and look, if you will, at verse 8. Micah chapter six or chapter 2 and look, if you will, at verse number 8. Even of late my people has risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely. As men adverse from war. Notice verse 9. The women of my people have you cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children have you taken away my glory forever. Go to chapter 3 and verse 10. They build up Zion with blood. That's what a lot of men are doing. Whatever it takes to advance their cause and their career, their profile. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof. Again, the leadership teach for hire. The prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord uh, and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Notice the flippancy. And then chapter 6 and verse 12. For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. And so an abandonment of mercy. There's no love of mercy in Micah's day. And sadly, in our day, with most men, the same uh, could be said. There is a lack of love for mercy. I may give you two things underneath of this this morning that you could jot down. Number one, go if you will back to verse 7. Let's read the end of the verse, and then we'll get to the point. Will the Lord be pleased? Notice the end of the verse. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? There's the, the extravagance. God's not impressed with that. Shall I give my, excuse me, firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Number two, or the second aspect of what does not impress God, relational sacrifice does not impress God. Loving mercy, men who love mercy realize relational sacrifice does not impress God. Micah continues this kind of exaggeration, this hyperbole, if you will, and says, maybe if even I give up or I sacrifice my firstborn child, that's the reference of the fruit of his body, that somehow that will atone for his sinfulness. Now, obviously, Micah is not condoning the evil practice of child sacrifice. In fact, it's forbidden in the law. He asks these questions and ends with this extreme one to, realize, to make people realize, and these men, there's nothing you can do to atone for your, your sin. There's nothing you can do to compensate for it. There must be another solution. And may I just say today, you are not a godly man when you will sacrifice everything before you sacrifice yourself, and including you'll sacrifice your family for what you want and what you're trying to achieve. Before we go on, I want to show you just a brief video clip. I don't do this too much in our preaching times, but I think it captures the spirit of, and I would ask you men today as you watch this, where are you sacrificing people? You maybe wouldn't literally throw your son or daughter upon an altar and offer them as a burnt sacrifice as the pagans would have in this day, but you're giving up on them to gain something yourself. You're cutting corners as it relates to the, the, their education or the influences around them or how much time you're with them. Uh, consider this. Let's watch. You know, Google says we look at our phones more than 600 times a day. 600 times we are no longer present. How can we be a great employee, a great employer, a great leader? More importantly, how can we be a great dad? A great mom? A great friend? When we are constantly distracted by this thing that makes us feel important. I love the story about the man who works from his home office and a little boy comes in one day, he's eight years of age, he says, Daddy says, sorry, son, I'm busy. Next day, little boy comes in, hey, Daddy, any chance we can play catch? Sorry, son, I'm busy. Third day in a row, little boy comes in, knocks on Daddy's door. Daddy says, son, told you yesterday, told you the day before, I'm busy, I can't play catch. He says, oh, Dad, I wasn't going to ask you to play catch today. He goes, oh, what were you going to ask me? He says, I was going to ask you how much money you earn an hour. 
Daddy says, son, that's a very rude question, but I earn $50 an hour. And the reason why I earn $50 an hour, so I can put a roof over your head and food in your tummy. So please get them out of my office. I've got work to do. Little boy doesn't knock on that door for a week, a month. Two months goes by before that little boy knocks on daddy's door. He knocks on daddy's door. He says, hey, daddy, yes, son. Daddy, over the last two months, I've been mowing lawns. I've been pruning trees. I've been doing every single chore that my mum has asked of me, and I've been able to raise $25. Daddy, I was wondering if I'd give you this $25. Could I please just have half an hour of your time? And daddy, could we please go and play catch? I would give away every little bit of success I've ever had. Every asset I own. To have a healthy little boy come and knock on my door and say, hey daddy, any chance we go and play catch? I promise you when you begin to prioritize what's important, you finally start to begin to live your life. That's good, isn't it? It's convicting, but it's good. Can I just encourage you today that the things that we give our time to tell us what's important to us? And for the men in the room, maybe that video brings back some regrets or some things even this last week of how you manage your time. But God gives us a way forward. And the way forward is to put Him first and to put those responsibilities He's entrusted to us first. See, to be a leader means that we assume the responsibility that God has given us in the proper order. And I think we as men sometimes, the tendency is to get those out of whack. Yeah, you should be working hard. Yeah, you should be advancing in different areas in development of your life, but don't ever do so at the expense of the primary ones. And if God gave you a wife and God gave you kids or God's given you grandkids or other areas of influence, do not sacrifice those relationships for the purpose uh, that God has given to you. By the way, that's why you're a man. You're most a man when you're doing the things God has given you, not when you've got the hobby going and the buddies together or whatever. You're most a man when you're doing those things that God's given you as a father uh, and as a leader. I was thinking as I was reflecting on that areas of scripture that speak to this, you remember Joshua as he's winding down his years uh, of leadership and they're just moments from uh, transition of leadership. And in Joshua 24, in fact, I think we have time. Would you turn there for just a moment? I'd like you to look at these verses. Joshua 24, we'll come back to Micah in just a minute. Look, if you will, at verse number 14. Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 14. And this is, I think, an invitation we all should give to those that follow us as leaders. Joshua 24. And if you will, please look at verse number 14. Joshua, as he's beginning to hand off the mantle to the next generation of leaders, he says this, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. Notice that sincerity. So we're talking the guts of our faith, the interior aspect. And put away the gods which your fathers served. Notice that, which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil uh, to you, unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Were the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in which land ye now dwell? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I love that about Joshua. He doesn't just say, but as for me, he says, me and my house. Our family is going to keep God in his proper place. And so may we allow God to help us to not sacrifice our relationships, not give them up, but give ourselves to them to please and honor the Lord. All right, now go back to our text in Micah. And if you will, notice the middle uh, of verse, I'm sorry, the beginning of verse number uh, eight. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, what doth the Lord require of thee, notice, but to do justly, notice this, and to love mercy. Number two, relational sacrifice does not impress God. Number two, relational mercy does honor God. Relational mercy does honor God. How many of the guys in the room, when I say, how many of you have played mercy, you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying when I ask that question? Um, I have played mercy as a child, and then a few times, especially, at least, I don't know that I've done it in the last week or two, but I've played it into my adolescent years. And one of the things I find interesting, you know what the game is, right? Where you grab each other's arm and you twist till one of you is hurting so bad he cries out mercy. 
There are guys that literally would rather have their arm ripped out of socket or off their body before they're willing to mutter mercy, to let that be said. Because that, that's viewed as you gave up, you're a wimp, you're the, you're the inferior man in this interaction. Mercy and manhood are often pitted against one another. And yet this idea here to love mercy, uh, the Hebrew word that's found here in verse number 8, uh, carries the idea of covenant loyalty. Uh, covenant loyalty, uh, and it necessitates this inward commitment to what God has revealed and an inward commitment to honoring God no matter how relationship moves forward. Can I just say today, ultimately our relationship with God is defined not, listen to me, not by what we give, but what we receive. Is that not true? It's talking about all kinds of sacrifices here in this text. But ultimately, our relationship with God is defined not by what we give to Him. Lord, look at me and how amazing I am as a man, as a woman, as a young person, whatever the case may be. It's about what we receive. We are in Christ. We have Christ as our personal Savior. And so obviously, that involves mercy on God's part. Go to the end of Micah. Go to the next chapter and look, if you will, at verse 18. And these might be the second little cluster of verses if you've memorized any verses out of or familiar with verses out of the book of Micah, speaks to this idea of receiving mercy. Verse 18 of Micah 7, Who is a God like unto thee? Uh, Micah ends with this kind of celebratory worship of God that pardoneth iniquity, that passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he, notice, delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. And then probably the phrase you're familiar with, and will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That is the mercy that we have received. Mercy from a heavenly Father. Mercy that should then be shared as we are conduits with those in our lives. Key application this morning. Loyalty to the most important people in your life will always require mercy. You want to know why? Because they're flawed and so are you. The reason your relationships are dysfunctional today is because people have to earn it. To get it, they have to earn it to keep it, or they got to claw their way back into your favor. A godly man says, we're all flawed, we're all sinners, we're all growing and progressing. I have to give mercy to have strong, vibrant relationships. And so God calls us as men to love mercy. Men, of all the things you just savor, the things that you just, you want to chew every ounce of satisfaction out of it, if you will. Is mercy one of them? You treasure the moments in your life and in your leadership where you were able to give mercy, where you're able to receive mercy. It's one of your favorite places to be, a place where mercy is being manifested. Um, we just got done moving this last week, and my hands, I've got splinters and dings. I actually look like I work for once. I know you guys think us preachers only work an hour a week or whatever your narrative is that you have. Um, and uh, so we've just been kind of tearing through moving. We started on Wednesday, and at least everything's under the roof today. Um, and my boy Ian, who was on the youth group trip, I, I don't know if it was during the trip or while we were in and out of the house, but he's got a bite on his cheek, and I haven't seen him yet. Uh, but Heidi ran him into the clinic this morning. He's just swelling up and his eyes starting to close a little bit. I don't know if it was a spider bite or what happened, but anyway, he's getting that checked out. It was just interesting because he had told me earlier in the day, and Heidi was out of the house most of the day, and I kind of, okay, buddy, let's keep moving. You know, move that box and go take that. It was just kind of no big deal. You know, dad just kind of callous toward the need. Mom gets home, come sit by me on the couch, buddy. Let's measure how big the spot is and then track if it's growing. And she, she, you know, she's just taking care of him. Monitor That tender touch, that mercy, is that something that we manifest as men? You will never keep your man card with God if you're calloused. Choose to give, choose to embody God-honoring mercy. All right, lastly, go back to our text to Micah chapter 6 and look, if you will, at the end of verse number 8, he says this, So do justly, love mercy. So there's the outward, there's the inward. Notice now, and to walk humbly with thy God. Thirdly and lastly, we need upward kind of directional masculinity. Upward masculinity. Walk humbly with thy God. If you will, go back to our text in Micah. Go back to chapter 2 again and look at verse 3. And there are several places that illustrate a wrong walk before the Lord, but this would just be one of them, where the nation had gotten out of step with God, 
And they had done so because of of pride. Micah 2, verse 3, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil from you which shall not remove your necks. Notice this, neither shall you go, what's the word? Haughtily, proudly, for this time is evil. And so we see this issue of pride in Micah's day. They They were not walking in humble fellowship. They were trying to walk before God in pride. What's the number one thing that the male... The, the, pro, the, the word male is followed by the male what? The male ego. Uh, we men are known not for our passivity, at least in the sense that we're talking today. We're not known for our um, tenderness. We're not known for some of these other things. And we also are not known, unfortunately, often for our humility. Men are wired to be um, initiators Men are wired, and so I'm not discounting any of those things. We're wired to do things, but the problem is in our fallen condition, we have been sabotaged. We have been diverted from our primary purpose as leaders, and in, that pla- in its place, we've become egotistical. Uh, we've become autonomous where we need to be humble. All right, let's talk about a couple of areas spoken about in the text. Number one, jot this down. Elevated pretense does not impress God. Elevated pretense. Go back to chapter 6 again and notice verse number 6. Elevated pretense does not impress God. Verse number 6, the first verse that we began with today, Micah says this on behalf of the people of God, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Elevated pretense. Speaking of the nation now, Micah asks if what they should do is to come before God and to make this big show and to bow down and to offer up to Him these burnt sacrifices. And obviously burnt sacrifices were not a bad thing. But the feel of verse 6 is a showiness. It's, it's, a, it, it's a pretense at, at sanctification. It's a pretense at a sacred intention toward God when nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I just recently uh, had the privilege of getting a new vehicle or newer vehicle to me. Um, and as I was shopping, uh, my boys especially like, Dad, you need to get a truck. You need to get a, a man, a real truck. And he kept, they kept going about what color and especially they just wanted a truck. You know, Dad, instead of these wimpy little SUVs you drive or whatever they're thinking. Um, and uh, at the time, our, my drive home every day, if you've seen this lot on the corner of Smithville Western and, and 3, but um, they, have, they have trucks there, okay? Um, rather pricey trucks, okay? Um, and uh, so every, and for years we've been driving by that lot since it opened. And, and so I know that probably is in their mind as they see that every day going back and forth, like, Dad, get a real vehicle. Um, but uh, that lot and others, have you noticed how guys like to do a lift kit on their truck, like get the thing off the ground? You know, where a grown man could probably walk underneath as they drive by if they timed it right and wouldn't even, you know, crease his hair these lift kits. Um, and, and, and can I just say nothing wrong with that? If you have one, I don't see any out in the North parking lot right now, but uh, if you have that, not necessarily knocking that, but it's interesting the things that we try to do to kind of just get ourselves up above the fray and to kind of get ourselves where people can notice our, uh, our props or our assets or whatever we have going on. Can I just say today for many of us men, the tendency where we are inferior or inadequate is to try to fill that or to, to prop up instead of being what God wants, and that is to be broken where we need to be broken and to be humble where we need to be humble. Elevated pretense before a God who knows our heart is an effort in futility. Those with a heaven-issued man card don't need the lift kit. They, who, they are who they are through Jesus Christ. That's all they need. I, I mean, I'm seated already, Ephesians 2 said, in heavenly places. This, this foolish little lift kit here has nothing compared to uh, what God provides for me in eternity. Uh, so we need to be open to that. I think we have time. Would you go to Luke chapter 18? Let me bring this into the New Testament context. Hold your place there in Micah, because some of you won't find it again if you lose it before we're done. Luke 18. And if you will, please look at verse number 9. Luke 18 and verse 9. This would be just one illustration of where men struggle and the two options that we have that as a man of God, as someone who's seeking to retain or to secure our man card, if you will, with God, uh, we need to grapple with this. Luke 18, let's begin in verse number 9. Christ here is teaching, and he says this in verse 9, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. This is key to understand the rest of the text. 
that they were righteous and despised others. All right, They've lifted themselves. They're looking down on others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. All right, so that's option one. Option two, verse 13. And the publican, all right, tax collector, someone that would have been looked down on no matter what his moral standings were, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breath upon his breast, saying, God be, what's the next word? Merciful to me, a sinner. Christ then gives this summary. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. My question to you this morning is, which of those two men are you? Are you propping yourself up? Are you going through the pretenses? Even in this church setting today, it's so easy to sit upright or to sit with a certain profile, but God knows your heart. He knows my heart. These elevated pretenses do not impress God. This past week, the teens, the youth group, Miss Brainy, Pastor Dave, and 17 of our teenagers went to Florida, a thousand miles one way, a thousand miles back. They had a fun trip, different things, challenges they faced, as most youth group trips are. And uh, one of the things we had happen when they were about 15 miles away is one of the brake lines went out on the shuttle bus. Uh, and so uh, they bumped the back of a car, and Pastor Dave said, man, I'm so sorry, sorry. I said, that's fine. And then once we got into it, it wasn't even his fault, you know, as far as the brake line going and no, no pressure there. But I was just thinking about in context of this study that we're on today, the real man this past week was not the guy cruising around Wayne County with his lift kit. It was a man taking 17 teenagers to Florida in a shuttle bus, wasn't it? That's the real man. That's the real man. And we all have a choice to make, and there are others, unfortunately, who are following behind us. If we're making the, the, the high profile, the pretense move, and there are others following us if we're making the right move. Those being impacted by our sacrifice or our pursuit of celebrity and our own profile. Be a man. Be a man that discards the pretenses for the substance that God desires. Which leads us back to our text in Micah 6. Look, if you will, at the end of verse number 8. He says, and to walk, notice this next word, this adverb that describes the verb walk. To walk humbly, this is the manner in which you're to walk, walk humbly with thy God. Number two, and lastly, jot this down, elevated humility does honor God. Elevated pretense does not impress God. Elevated or offered to God humility does honor God. Um, Brother Justin and I were joking about this last Sunday. He reminded me of this. Um, any of you remember going to auctions as a kid with your father? That's one of, probably one of my best memories of my dad. We, we, I don't know, we rarely bought much of substance. We'd often buy a lot of like random tools in a big old box, and that was fun afterwards to dig through. What do we got? And yeah, Dad has three, so maybe he'll let me have that or whatever. But I remember one of the things he told us from, I mean, from the age I can remember even going, we always would get hot cider usually at some random trailer, and we'd get our ticket number, and we'd go through the whole the sights and smells of all that go with going to it. Usually it was muddy. I remember that, and you're parking out in some field you hope you can get back out of uh, at the end. But he would tell us, do not raise your hand. And he said, you raise your hand, you're buying it. You know, Only those with money who are serious about being here are the ones raising their hand. So I was, even if my head scalp's itching or my, you know, you just kind of, you know, just stand like this, you know, in the crowd and it's cold usually and you're trying to keep your hands down. I love the verse in 1 Timothy 2 where Paul is saying, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up what kind of hands? Holy hands, lifting up holy hands uh, without wrath and without doubting. That's the kind of humbleness we need to lift to the Lord. Elevated humility honors God. Men in the room, I don't care what else you have going. You know the thing that will please and honor God most? It's not what's on your wrist. It's not what's parked in your driveway. It's not how amazing your house or your career, or what people refer to at work is. It's are you offering them humility? That's what gets his attention today. Isn't that so counterintuitive? 
We use all these other props and these profiles when all God wants from his men is elevated humility. Upwardly, this idea that's carried on here at the end of verse 8 has this idea to walk humbly with God necessitates a right attitude toward God and a determination to walk that out in continuous fellowship with him. Back in verse 6 that we referenced earlier, he says, and bow myself before the Most High God. I found that most manhood is manifested not by a big show in a moment where we just bow prostrate before God. It's we just walk with him every day. We just walk with God. We're in step with him and he is in step with us. And this, this Jesus fellowship, this discipleship, one foot in front of the other is where truly we honor and please the Lord. One author I was reading said this, if God was trying to point us to great men, he would not have included the negative details of their lives in the Bible. They have all sinned and fallen short. Religion enshrines its saints. The Bible in its entirety points us to Jesus alone. We're not following men. And those that are following you, men, ultimately are not following you. They're following Christ. Walk out that walk with humility. You control your walk. That's the humble view of your life. Stop making excuses. That's the pride view of life. Let God lead you. Be the man God has called you to be. Um, The other day I heard this. I thought it was challenging to me. Maybe you'll challenge the men in the room who struggle with laziness or apathy or just not being engaged where you need to be in your walk with the Lord. Author said this, only you can lead you. Others think they have influence over you, but at the end of the day, real influence starts and ends with self. Decide, choose, promote yourself to CEO of you. Then ask God to give you the guts and grit to get the job done. Just own it. Own your walk. Own your walk and then walk it out with the Lord's help. Um, Just this thought and we'll move on. The proud person is always a victim. It's, It's just true. The humble person is always responsible. Let God remove the excuses and in its place give you personal responsibility. Elevate humility. Own your humility or pride. Please and honor the Lord as a result. You will never keep your man card with pride intact. Choose God honoring humility. All right, let's end today. Would you go to Deuteronomy chapter 10 for just a moment and verse number 12. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And verse, hold your place there, Micah. Don't lose that. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. And let's look at verse number 12. Before we get that, one other way you could probably lose your man card today is if you didn't know the NBA Finals were being played this last week or last couple of weeks. Um, Maybe some of you aren't into sports, but men, I guess we tend to gravitate towards sports. And I want to show you a couple of pictures that I think illustrate where our culture is out of step with the Lord. This is a picture from the second round, I believe, of the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't know with the lights if you can see it real well, but the guy squatted down. Kawhi Leonard ended up being the MVP of the NBA Finals that ended just, I think, this last Thursday. We were moving, so I really didn't track much of that this past week. Um, but it's a shot of him, and you can kind of see, see the ball like kind of on the rim. Basically what happened, this is game seven. The ball's bouncing around, and then it bounces in. So that's the wide frame. Now notice this next picture. This is a picture, and again, with the light, maybe you can't see it, but see the guy in the middle? He's the guy that shot it. There's the opposing player. And then see the guy there, the bench player on the right, his, his facial expression? What are they watching for? They're watching for what? To see if the ball goes in or out, right? Is there a third option? No, either the ball goes in and the Raptors win, the guy in the white, or the ball bounces out and the guy to the left His team wins, right? There's a point of no return. You either make it or you miss it. Now, here's the thought. We don't accept this kind of, "Eh, I guess we're okay, or I don't know, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not, in almost any other area. But in how we steward our homes, how we do marriage, how we do manliness, how we do masculinity, we're tolerating uh, this idea of there is no standard when God would say the exact opposite. Where do we need exactly what God expects most? In our homes, uh, in our relationships that God has given to us. All right, look here in Deuteronomy 11. Now, do you remember the beginning of verse 8? God says, God has told you what he expects, right? 
So the question you should have had when we read the beginning of verse 8 was, where did God tell the Israelites what he's repeating in Micah 6? Well, let's go back to it. Deuteronomy chapter 10, and if you will, please, let's look at verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good? Behold, the heavens, and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God, the earth also with all that is therein. Only the Lord hath delight in thy fathers to love them. He chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, and a great God, and a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute judgment of the fatherless, the widow, and loveth the stranger, and giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, thou shalt serve him, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score, that's sixty, and ten persons, so seventy. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Now, if you have your Bible and you did what I said, the three of you who did, if you hold your place between Deuteronomy chapter 10 and Micah chapter number 6, that's almost half your Bible, isn't it? Do you see that? It's almost half my Bible. It represents 700 years. 1400 B.C. was when Moses gave the rewriting of the law in Deuteronomy. 700 years later, under the rule of Hezekiah, Micah pens his book. 700 years where they didn't do what God said. Judges, one of the saddest books in the Bible, they did what was right in their own eyes. Every man did what was right in their own eyes. Every man. It was a boy in Deuteronomy. And then their kids and their grandkids, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. My question to you is this, how long does it have to go on before we men do what God has said and set the precedent and lay the framework and lay the pathway by which the next generation can do these exact same things? Ultimately, we are called to be fathers to glorify God. That's groundbreaking. That's foundational. And then to reproduce these same traits in the young men who will come after us. The question is, will they have, an, have, have a heaven-issued man cart because of your influence or lack thereof, like those in the days of Micah? Here's the question, we're done. Will you assume responsibility to secure your man cart? Men, or you lead? Are you willing to own these responsibilities? Ladies and young people, as you support and model and, and partner with in other areas, will you allow God to give you an outward obedience, an inward obedience, and an upward obedience to these commands? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today.